and uh, the uh, rice producing desert of kaveri at the same time we find traders from kerala going up to melin and mombasa sometimes as far as mozambique to procure gold gold entered kerala in those days mainly through african channels the menamutta of gold or gold to obtain from the sambasi valley they happen to be the major source for gold meaning gold currency in 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 in, in the terrains of samurin and elsewhere so for procuring gold and also for procuring slaves and for obtaining ivory traders from uh, coastal kerala were going to melin and mombasa and we find vasco de gama meeting uh, kerala traders on the coast of melin in 1498 on his way to calicut gujarati traders and muslim traders were also there uh, playing in the indian ocean Uh, connecting different communities and societies on the border of Indian Ocean, procuring commodities and distributing commodities from Kerala side as well as from other parts of India. We find here this part of Cochin experienced the earliest presence of Makandail Muslim community in Central Kerala. They uh, used to come from Oman and also as well as from Aden, the Nayanars or the Nayana Muslim community of this region, happened to be one of the earliest Muslim community. And we find Muslims uh, uh, who concentrated in Kail Patanam, who even he made, uh, and the neighboring places of Karmanda coast, frequenting this. Uh, Port of Cochin after its appearance in 1341, the flood in the Piriyar water, Piriyar River, silted up the northern part, uh, northern branch of Piriyar, obstructing entry of vessels in Karanganur. Why the southern branch of Piriyar made opening into the sea in the terrain between uh, this part of uh, Cochin and the other part. Uh, which later came to be called Waipin, the newly deposited landmass. Uh, the water uh, passage was made possible because of the heavy flow of flood waters that happened in 1341. And a new port appeared here, which is being called Kochari, and the abbreviation of Kochari happened to be the present name with which this geography of this place is being now known. That is Kochi. Kochari, Kochari, Kochi. Now, what I would like to say is that when Mahavan visited Cochin in 1407, he saw traders coming from Southeast Asia, Klings, who have been Kalingas, conducting trade here, and the Arab traders, the Mohammedans, and the Chittis conducting trade here, which would mean Makande traditions of different regions converse here. And the shipbuilding traditions of different geographies also converged here. About the literature on shipbuilding, it is very difficult to find a proper literature to study shipbuilding traditions in Kerala. This Yukti Thayar, Yukti Kalpa Thayar, is a Sanskrit work. Uh, attributed to Pochiraja, he is a Paramara uh, uh, ruler from Malba region, and Navoi Satiram obtained from Tarangam Padi, Kapal Satiram of Tarangam Padi, and Kolthirai in Kapal part of the late 18th century, then Kalavattu part, Kanakayam Chiramakavum. These are the pieces of literature that we will find. to study something about the uh, shipbuilding traditions in south india the rest we find from transmission of oral information from mouth to mouth people are being communicating information regarding shipbuilding and generations preserved it as a secret piece of information and they did not allow this information to get divulged but unfortunately there's a uh, this ro- uh, this rich deposit of knowledge regarding shipbuilding got lost and what we try to gather out of what was being left out left over in the form of kalavat kalavat part or kurthrai and kapal part 
uh, or uh, Navoy Satira, all these works, help to reconstruct a bit of the nature of tradition that appeared in South India regarding shipbuilding. And we obviously we get some information from the Portuguese information, we leave the fabric in the snows, we leave the Prameer, the Architectura Naval, which are being reprinted in 1990s in Lisbon. As I mentioned earlier, uh, different types of trade, different layers of trade happen. Trade, that is coastal trade, trade between eastern coast and western coast, that is coastal trade. Riverain traffic also happen, which required another type of vessel for commodity movement. At the same time, there are trans-oceanic voyages going as far as African coast, going as far as Oman, going as far as Sohar, which require another genre of vessels and uh, ships. So different varieties of vessels were being used for movements of people and commodity and uh, uh, cargo from one part of the geography to another part. What the base of use for which the vessels are being uh, utilized the shape of the vessel used to change. The timber that has been used for building ships also got changed. Don't think that the same ship was used for every type of commodity movement, cargo movement. The people used to take 30,000 quintals of pepper per year from Cochin in the 1500 or 1520s, 1530s, etc. 30,000 quintals of pepper. In, a, in the vessels going to Lisbon. That doesn't mean the same ship can be take, used for transporting horses for hormones or musket. It required another type of vessel. Similarly, uh, uh, elephants were being taken from uh, uh, Ceylon and they were being uh, taken to Kochi. So it required another type of uh, vessel. So on the basis of the purpose for which the vessels are being used, the shipbuilding pattern used to vary considerably. And the purpose decided the design. It determined the nature of timber that are being used. That's one category of decision that uh, the builders used to take at the, in the initial phase. And most of the vessels, they were being stitched. Different versions are there in uh, Yukti Kalpatayaru uh, regarding the use of iron, I mean, use of kaya stitches. They used to stitch one plank upon the other. The stitching of one plank upon the other gave the ship owners chances for adding the size of the vessel. They could keep on adding new planks, which they could stitch. Another advantage is, when the stitched vessels used to hit against the corals of the straits, or the Gulf region, or the coast, the vessels, despite hitting against the hard corals, it could adjust itself and this will act as a shock absorber. That would not allow a break to happen on the plank. So instead of uh, use of iron nail, they used to stitch the plank one upon the other. But there was also a strong belief among the sailors and the ship uses that if you use iron nail, the planks would get rotten. Second thing, if you use more iron nail, the, 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 the story in circulation was that there are many magnetic rocks beneath the seawater. The vessels which are plying on the seawater, they would be attracted to the magnetic rock and the ship would be frequent and would be heavy if they use iron nails. So till 16th century, 17th century, we find most of the ships being stitched instead of being fixed together with iron nail. And in certain cases, they used the wooden nail, not the iron nail. The piece of the wood is being used, is being cut, and is being uh, thrust into the hole so that the, the different plaques may be kept.
tight. So in Israel, iron nail they used mostly wooden nail, and most cases they stitch the vessels. This is the stitching that I have been referring to. You see planks upon another, I mean one plank upon the other. Planks were being kept, and this provided chances for the builder or the user to expand the size of the vessel. The master carpenter, while doing it, you can very well make out the uh, stitch part of the vessel, the inside part of the vessel. Any vessel plying on the sea water requires different genres and different species and types of timber. But timber doesn't have one of the same quality and specification. The quality of the timber is being familiar with the carpenters and the ship uh, makers because they know what each, what are the specifications, what are the qualities of different timber that they are using in the shipbuilding process. So obviously, they made a selection regarding the planks to be used for different parts of the ship. Obviously, the planks used for the ship lying under seawater should have the ability to resist salinity. You know, the vessels used to get rotten and destroyed if the saline level is high. So timber which could resist salinity could be used, they are being used for that part of the ship lying beneath the, the sea water, the saline water. And similarly, for the, as you proceed further, we will see the other, 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 other types of uh, uh, plants and timber species being used for other parts as well. So, since different species and different varieties and types of timber are being used for timber build, ship building, access to timber yielding forest is an, an inevitable condition for a place to emerge as a ship building center. If the timber is not accessible, is not available in the neighborhood, then ship building would not flourish. So we find shipbuilding tradition evolving in certain limited geographies and these geographies develop a certain type of specialized culture, specialized tradition regarding shipbuilding. So the shipbuilding tradition in Bayport is one which we may not find in Porakar, which we may not find in Cochin because it depended on two things. One, the type of timber available in the neighborhood necessitated a certain type of specialization. And the purpose for which the vessels were being built also decided a certain specialization to appear. Third thing, the connectivities that these regions had also played a vital role in deciding the specialization. If certain trade centers had more connectivities with the musket from where horses were being imported or with the hormones from where horses were imported on large scale for further use either sometimes in the Bahmani kingdom of Deccan, sometimes in the um, Vijayanagara kingdom. It did not stop in the port where these horses landed. They were still taken into the interior and they were being used for war needs either in the Bahmani kingdom or in the uh, Vijayanagara kingdom. But the port, because of the heavy traffic in uh, um, uh, horse trade, trading in horses, Create a certain type of shipbuilding tradition you know, that specialized in bringing horses uh, from musket or from 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 hormos. So we find uh, Bayport was located near the Lumber Forest. Connectivity was being ensured with the help of Chalia River, and uh, Kallai River was there, which also facilitated transportation of timber from um, from Wayanad Ghats and so on. And we find uh, Bombay located near Thara, Thana Forest, wherever located near the Gir Forest in Gujarat, Kadalu located near the Koli Forest, and Baleshwar Midnapur located near the Chotan Nagpur Forest. So 
abundant supply of timber in the neighborhood decided the geography where shipbuilding tradition evolved. Kallai and Chaliar were the major fluvial channels through which uh, timber was being floated to vapor or Kodikon. This is one of the earliest depiction of a Malabari ship of 1631. You see the type of vessels being uh, the vessels being used by the Malabari uh, 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 traders and uh, sailors. Oars are there, mast is there. Uh, yeah. This gives a rough picture. This is the earliest representation of a Malabari ship. In the process of building ship, I mentioned the variety of timber, the genre of the timber decided the strength and the durability of vessel. At the same time, the Tachin and the carpenter had a notion about the time for felling the tree. Not every part of the year is not suitable for felling the tree. So they identified certain uh, uh, span of the year or part of the year as the most ideal time for cutting the trees. You know, the, the, the trees are cut when the sap of the tree is in its condensed form and its mature form in the tree. If the sap is gone, then the vitality is gone. So when the sap is there, the tree in the condensed form, in the mature form, they cut the trees. In Europe, they used to cut the trees in winter. When the, when the tree is not sweating the, the, because of the extreme hot. Here also, very often in the monsoon period or when the rain is there, when the sap is there in its fullness, they used to cut the tree. So at the same time, they used to observe Muhurta. Muhurta is connected with the superstition in the scientific society. But Muhurta doesn't mean mere superstition alone. It would mean the auspicious time, the right time for felling a tree where the sap is there in its fullness. At the same time, you know that the tree would be useless if the tree is cut during the Karatha Pokkam. You know that, when the, the, the vitality is gone. Full moon and the new moon, they exert a considerable amount of influence on the presence of white, sap and the vitality. And when the tree has its sap in its fullness, then you can uh, cut the... Uh, uh, when there is no moon, that kartavakam, no? Then you can cut the tree, because at that point of time, the sap is in its fullness. Though it may appear to be superstitious, this was some sort of... Uh, scientific perception that they developed over a period of time out of their experiential knowledge that at certain juncture of time the sap is not in its fullness. And if, the, uh, if it has been cut during the full moon time, then the tree is useless. So some sort of understanding regarding the failing has been done, which would give certain notion of spirituality, certain notion of sacredness to the very exercise that will give you the that will take exercise from the very mundane level to a level of providence and say that everything happens and everything we are trusting in the hands of the Lord and the God will make everything propitious. So, some sort of pujas would be performed. Then the master carpenter, the mupa, he would. Uh, 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 decide the muhurta, the tree would be felled, it will be cut, and it will be dragged with the help of elephant to the nearest riverine channel. Transportation of timber from India, because the most of the forests were located in the India. The trees to be cut in the India and to be floated down to the port or the shipbuilding center would mean enormous cost. And to reduce the cost of 
transportation, they use the fluvial ch channel. And the animal, the particular uh, elephant has been used to drag the uh, timber from the place where it has been cut down, because the timber is huge. And it's been floated down to the river. It's been floated down to uh, the mouth of the sea with the use of therapem. We will see. A number of trees were tied together with hundreds of dry bamboos for keeping that trees floating. This mode of transportation is called therapem. Particularly, this is where that is being used in Bepur and other places. They were made to float on the waters of the river with the help of thodis or canoes, and then they were taken down. In the initial stage, at the low, high, at the upper part of the river, the therapums happened to be small in size with a few timber pieces, with a few logs. As, it, as the therapy used to come down, different therapums were combined together, they were joined together, they were being floated down, and by the therapum mooper, and therapakar, and they spent, they were uh, uh, taking it down on the river day and night with the stops only for food and uh, other requirements. Small, small hotels sprang up in different parts of the river basins, uh, which we can see even on the banks of Peria. If you go, to, go through Peria, we find different uh, uh, small, small uh, halting centers being erected long back. If you do any field study along the banks of the river, you find old halting centers being erected long, long back, where they used to take temporary shelter and where they used to take temporary uh, consumables and, uh, I mean, temporary stay and uh, eating consumables, uh, edibles, and they used to float the timber down. This would mean, shipbuilding doesn't mean mere piling of two varieties of planks or two different types of timber, two different genres of uh, timber. It would mean a cultural process. It would mean a socio-economic mobilization. It would mean uh, activation of a large chunk of people living in the uh, remote forest along the coast, I mean, along the banks. And then when it comes to the actual shipbuilding centers, then again we find mobilization of different nature happening. Uru, Urus are almost closer to uh, the Daos of Arab shipbuilding nature. And so they were being built of purely of timber and they fastened by coir ropes and caulked with a special glue made of animal fat or uh, uh, punne oil. Sometimes uh, uh, wooden nails or pegs are being used. They were built by the Tachans belonging to Vishwakarma community and their knowledge was being transmitted. They never wrote down their information in any written book, but they used to convey this information from one generation to another generation through word of mouth. Because it's uh, the monopoly that they retained. Just like the Coca-Cola people retained their monopoly with regard to the formula of making uh, Coca-Cola, the Tajins enviously kept the secret of making of ships close to themselves. That is why the, the weakness of the ship should not be made known to the enemy. And the strength factor of the ship should also should not be divulged to the enemy. That's why different ships had developed, different ship building centers had developed different strategies regarding the building and regarding the uh, formatting of uh, ships uh, over a period of time. This is the famous picture of uh, Calicut of 1571. You must have seen elephants standing there on the shore and ships being half built and the timber that he used to reach Baipur or Calicut through Kalai River or Chalia River, they were brought to the, I mean, to the shore and they were being taken from the shore to the shipbuilding center with the help of elephants where the Tachins used to make planks out of the timber and then they were being mm, affixed with the help of Kalasis with whom you have been familiar with. Elephants are there, shipbuilding process is happening, Tachin is there. I mean, it's, it's one of the most evident de pictorial depiction about shipbuilding 
activity happening in Kolkata, Calicut. This is an Uru, this uh, Uru that we have seen earlier, which comes closer to the Daos of Arab tradition, where stitching was being done, and it, it is in the process of building. Kalasis, as I mentioned earlier, they were the people who were the people who very much involved in taking the logs, the planks, heavy planks, to the shipbuilding center. They are being used for lifting the uh, train bogies near Kadalundi when that train tragedy happened. You must be familiar with it. So they had this developed this tradition of shifting heavy planks, heavy materials. They have been shifting heavy planks of the vessel and they were being involved in the construction process, also launching process as well. For also for keeling, the Kalasis lay the keel on a specially placed timber called Kalangi. They used to keep the long keel. Keel is the skeleton of the vessel. It should not be bent, it should not be curved. It should be of uniform length and girth. So you know, to identify a timber suitable for making keel would need a great amount of search. After cutting the right type of timber for making the keel, they used to bring to the shore, and which the Kalasis used to take to the Kalangi, and they used to lay it there, which happened to be the actual backbone for the ship. And, the, and they used the wooden pulleys, or wind just known as Sailangi, for, uh, for erecting and lifting and uh, building. Timber was, according to Kalavattu part of Nagur, timber has been divided into three different categories, masculine, feminine, and eunuch. This is a gender-based perception about the quality of the timber. I don't fully subscribe to this perception, but it shows that they knew something about the scientific qualities of the timber, though the nomenclature is something gender-related. Hmm? They knew something about the quality, the specification related to timber. And masculine timber is not the ideal type. Uh, feminine uh, timber is not the ideal type. So both of us are being excluded. The right type of timber suitable for making the keel, the skeleton, the backbone, the, the backbone of the sheep is, uh, is the eunuch type of timber, which would mean timber with a uniform length and girth. They are not curved, they are the same size, same length, starting from one point to another point of that timber. Different spice, uh, species of timber were needed for making different parts of the vessel, as I mentioned earlier. A timber used for making those parts uh, lying under water necessitate properties of resisting salinity. The saline water often used to destroy the vessel from beneath. Sea worms used to attack the water, watery planks. So the plank should have the ability to resist salinity and the attacks from the sea worms. And the planks used to above the water level, there are to be different species. Kolathirai and Kapalpata speaks of Ilupai, Karimarudha, Bendeka, then Punne, Aini, that's Anili, Anili Maram, Aini, Vendeka, Kungu. They were the most important timber species which are being used for making uh, vessels in South India, according to Kulatirai and Kapal Potter. The space between the two planks, as I mentioned earlier, there's a plank stitching happening, and this, when the stitches happened, there would be space in between. There would be space in between. And the space in between, if it's not properly uh, closed, leakage of water will happen. The ship will get drowned. So in order to avoid the shipwreck and the ship drowning, they used to cork it. They used to fill the space with the cotton, paduti. Paduti, cotton, and lime oil, or lime, or whale oil, or punna oil. 
they used to mix everything and this mixture they used to affix in, at the uh, space in between and this process is called the coking sometimes they used to mix uh, um, uh, the oil from the cashew shell in a cashew shell if it's burned you get the oil you mix the pani parthi in it and then affix the gap in between and then you get it cooked the ship building treaties is refer to two things one there is a skeleton which they call the every human being has a skeleton no the skeleton decides then height the size no if the skeleton is small the size would be small if it's uh, short then the length would be equally short it won't be tall person it not be tall person so the frame of the ship decides what should be the size of the vessel frame the skeleton of the body is can be created with the frame of ship it supports strength and some gives shape to the body and the frame of the ship gives strength and gives shape to the vessel the frames of the ship do the same in the hull the planking of a ship is compared to skin an animal the entire skeleton is a human being is being covered with the skin no? with the flesh and skin and the skin gives a good appearance to all of us and the planking the wooden planks that are being affixed to the skeleton that gives the final appearance and the shape to the uh, vessel the hull of a ship requires strong and hard timber enna karanam nu cheyya paaram mulve idilekku varane the hull has to bear the weight the end of weight of the ship if it is 30000 kindel paper the hull has to bear it so the timber used the planks used for the hull part of the ship has to be strong tough enough to resist the force coming from within and should also withstand the forces of wind and sea current very often the uh, timber used for ocean going vessels they are tough dry and bitter and resinous sap most of the timber species taken for the bottom part of the vessels were bitter in taste in order to resist the sea worms if the timber has got a, a sweet taste the i mean and pleasant taste the sea worms used to uh, attack it very frequently that's why they used aini it is resinous anili hmm? and sometimes the bitter uh, the timber uh, species having the bitter taste they have been used to be there beneath the sea water so it should be stand the impact of sea and wind yeah bitter sap can keep up the insects etc okay fine so when i look at the final part of it team i mean the ships were being used for riverine traffic ganges had it uh, i mean uh, ships to travel into the ganges waters which is different from the sea going vessel piria had its own ship or boat tradition hmm? which is different from the coastal boats coastal ships which is different from the transoceanic voyages indian ships used to take a rice from that is particularly traders from kasargod uduma region they used to take rice from mangalore basalore and batkal to oman to arabia to muscat hmm? and to soha these are the food deficient regions in west asia the food deficient regions are supplied with the rice but from ships taking origin from kerala uh, ship building tradition hmm? 
So it involves, it's not mere coastal trade. This is before you and before the Portuguese. Ships from Calicut used to go to Mombasa, Meland. It's transoceanic movement, which would mean the vessels need to be sufficiently larger in tonnage to take cargo, and it should be sufficiently strong enough to withstand the climatic adversities seen in the transoceanic voyages. Hmm? So besides the riverine traffic, transoceanic voyages were there, and pilgrims used to go in large numbers and frequency at one juncture of time every year on pilgrimage to Mecca. And Mecca pilgrimage would mean, Hajj pilgrimage, it's the greatest and the largest moving market. It's not, not people alone moving, commodities are also moving. They used to take commodities along with them to Mecca and they used to sell it on reaching Jiddah. And the money and profit they used to back out of this commodity sale used to subsidize, used to finance their trade. In, between, in Britain, they used to sometimes bring gold, sometimes they used to bring slaves, and these remnants of the slaves we find everywhere, including Cochin, including Calicut. So, transoceanic voyage was familiar to uh, Kerala uh, society. And Kerala shipbuilders used to bring, um, build ships that are capable of cutting across all adversities and all weather conditions across the ocean and take a more directly to the uh, other side of the ocean. We find in 1627, the Kasadus of Cochin, that would mean the married Portuguese settlers of Cochin, taking 2,000 kindles of paper in their own ship called Naveta. Going all the way along Mozambique, Cape of Good Hope, and going up to Lisbon. So it's not Indian Ocean travel that the vessels used to make. The travel up to Atlantic port of Lisbon, the Indian merchants used to involve in. That would mean the vessels produced in Cochin were capable of taking cargo across two currents prevailing in the Indian Ocean as well as in the Atlantic and take commodities up to Lisbon. Hmm? This is not done once, it is done almost for six years. Why the ships are being so, um, uh, I mean, uh, so much built in coastal Kerala, one, availability timber, one. And the other thing is, the nature of profit that they used to accrue, enormous profit they used to get. You see the picture, this is the statistics. This is obtained from the Cairo Genesa papers of the Jews. One sack of pepper, when it was produced, it was being obtained from Kerala, the price was only five dinars. Urchakne, anju dinari, five dinars. The moment it reached Aden, the moment it reached Yemen, the price increased up to 52 dinars. So there is a gap between 47 dinars. Le, dinar The moment it reached Cairo, the price was 135. It would really indicate the price difference in different geographies, in different markets in the Afro-Asian world. A sack of pepper, which was priced five dinars in the original center of its embarkation, used to fetch enormous profit the moment reach Aden. Much more profit the moment reached Cairo and Maghreb. This profit level actually prompted traders to get into trade and to get into shipbuilding. And go into the interior to fell the trees, to drag them to the river and take them to the coast and use the elephant to bring them to the shipbuilding center and cut the timber into different logs, different planks, make the service of uh, make use of the service of the Kalasis and the related uh, carpenters, local carpenters, 
and they help us to build the ship and take commodities because it fetch enormous profit for them. So the price difference indicates the profit difference at different junctures of trade. That's what the 11th century this is for the 15th century. In 14, 15, 28, the Mamluks declared spice trade as a royal monopoly for the Mamluks in Egypt. In the 1490s, one sack of pepper was 4.64 ducats. It's a Venetian uh, coin. This price was 25 ducats in Alexandria, Venice is 56 ducats, Lisbon 80 ducats. This will indicate the price difference at different junctures of trade, different points of trade, which would indicate the level of profit that one can accumulate by involving in commodity movement from one point to another. That made many people to take up the risk and to take up the commodity, I mean, to take part in the commodity movement because the profit was let you list. Don't think that all the difference indicate the profit. No. Because there's an exit tax, there's an entry tax, there's a transportation cost, and the vessel has to be changed from one part of the ocean space to another part of the ocean space. The vessel was, vessels were to be changed. But despite that, profit was considerably enormous, which made the people to pursue maritime trade and to get into shipbuilding activities, despite all oddities and adverse conditions. And go into the interior, cut the trees, bring them, and then it developed. So out of a material culture, out of a certain type of material background, material matrix, a new, uh, uh, there was a necessity to go into shipbuilding, to go into, to develop a shipbuilding tradition of a particular nature, uh, suiting the requirements of the locality, suiting the requirements of the trade in which that region is involved in. This is about the paper export and the price difference and the profit level, which I don't want to go into details. I mean, about 350 days they used to take for travel between Lisbon and Cochin. Sometimes you used to go up to 450 days. And water, provision, everything was water, but the water was not suitable for drinking. This point I brought in purposely to show you what all things were kept, not only the commodities, they had to keep, when you, when you go to Patana, you must have seen a lot of remnants of the Vainampora lying scattered there. These are the drinking material that they used to bring for the consumption on their onward journey. Similarly, the potters also used to bring uh, wine because water cannot be stored for more than three days. Then the water would get stagnated and contaminated. In order to overcome this problem of contamination, they used to put certain herbs, roots of the herbs, Ramachatinde Verile the roots of Ramacham, they used to put it so that the water may be purified and they used to drink that water. Mm. Or they used to halt in centers where water supply was in plenty. Mozambique was a major center for water supply. Goa was another center for water supply. Cochin water was not suitable for drinking, so they used to take water from Malanga to Varapoli region, where the fresh water was available, because here was stagnation was very much there. Because even now, mosquitoes are there in plenty. Stagnated, contaminated water is there, no? So they used to go all the way through Periyar branch up to Alangar Perapale side to get, and Alive side to get the fresh water. So, uh, then, food materials. They could not bring meat, beef or, chick or chicken meat or uh, uh, any other meat item they could not bring in. Because there was no fridge, there was no refrigerator. So they used to bring live chicken. And the live chicken, they are very dangerous. They are carriers of sickness. In 1570s or so, uh, 1565, about the 800 people, they, 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 they demonstrated symptoms of plague. Suddenly they collapsed, started falling down. The moment they displayed symptoms of sickness, they have been taken and thrown to sea. About 800 people who have been thrown to sea, so that others may not be affected. 
keeping chicken for the long travel from Lisbon to Cochin for almost for 350 days, that would mean large number of chicken they asked, you had to preserve in the ship. Besides the commodity, besides the people, around 800 to 900 people were there at times in the ship. So it's not mere commodity alone, it's not mere few diamonds alone, it's not mere rice alone, it's not mere horse alone. Different were the, different were the items, different were the humans, different were the uses that the vessels had. Hmm? Different categories of people were there, different commodities were there, and there should be sufficient space in the vessel for accommodating all these categories of people, all these categories of commodities, and different genres of um, uh, eatables and uh, different uh, varieties of eatables and edibles. So what I would like to say is that shipbuilding had to take care of not only commodity alone, but also a quite variety of things that were being essential on their onward and return voyages. Hmm? When I come to Cochin, just uh, two, three, five, five minutes, I will take. The first, the earliest uh, uh, shipbuilding uh, practice can be traced back to Duarte Pacheco. When Samurin attacked Cochin, he ordered repairing of vessel, uh, Caravelo Jose Rao, and at the same time, new vessels were built. This is the earliest reference of Portuguese documents regarding shipbuilding tradition in Fort Cochin. And 1506, the master Sao Gabriel, you know from um, Sao Gabriel, is, the, is the one of the three ships that accompanied Vasco de Gama in 1498. The master was being used for, manufacture, for building a ship in 1506. Ships built in Cochin, and, uh, I mean, built in Cochin was being used for conquering Goa in 1510 and also for meeting the military requirements and political requirements of due in 1534-35. the ship Saint Catherine of, uh, uh, Saint Catherine of Mount Sinai ship, this is the name of the ship. It was built, it had 800 tonnages, and it was being used for taking cargo back to Lisbon, and finally, it was gifted to Donna Beatrice, the daughter of Manuel I. 1516, when uh, there was a need for blocking Red Sea, a ship was built in Cochin by the Portuguese. They are being taken uh, to Aden to fight against the Sultan of Aden, Yemen ruler. And in uh, 1516, uh, immediately, uh, probably immediately after the occupation, or in the, on, on, the, on the eve of probably occupation of Aden by the Ottomans. Godinho speaks of a ship being built in Cochin and sold to merchants of Surat. 1527, that's the year when Cochin was raised to status of a city and the municipal council was established in 1527. We find Santa Cruz, the very name with which this city was made known. With the, the, the very name with which the village of Kochi was been raised to a city in 1527, we find a ship with the name Santa Cruz being built and it's being equipped with a piece of artillery which was being used very frequently for their patrolling purpose. And 1545, we find uh, uh, Sepulto uh, taking this vessel as the main uh, patrolling fleet or the armada as a part of the main vessel in the armada going up to Lisbon. From 1520s onwards, we find timber scarcity. Frequent letters are being sent to Portugal from Cochin, saying that there's few timber, very little timber for shipbuilding. You remember, this is a time before the coming of the Portuguese, the Maracar territories of Cochin, the Cherina Maracar, Mamala Maracar, Pate Maracar, Muhammad Ali Maracar, they had two or three or four vessels of large tonnage, more than 1,000 tonnage, which they could, uh, with which they could take commodities from Gochi into Gujarat and then to Red Sea. And they also used to take uh, elephants in their vessels. Such huge vessels were built in Cochin before the coming of the Portuguese. But by 1520s, 
because of the increase in the private trade we find shipbuilding tradition experiencing a dwindling phase and repeated mention has been found in the documents regarding the scarcity of timber in kochi in 1572 the municipality of kochi appointed two offices want to collect 1% customs duty on every cargo that entered kochi and this 1% money that they used to back was being used partly to supervise the shipbuilding activity and partly to uh, patrol the coast to avoid diversion of commodities to destinations other than portuguese the purpose was to make the vessels converge in portuguese trading center of kochi so that they may get 1% tax so that the shipbuilding tradition can be our shipbuilding activities can be made vibrant and active and functional and they decided at least to i mean they decided to build at least two vessels per year 1630 the portuguese entered into contract with the king of portugal for shipbuilding so this is a natural about the uh, Portuguese shipbuilding tradition that appeared in Cochin in the 16th and 17th century. This is the picture of Cochin, the city plan. You being the residents of Cochin, most of you being the residents of Cochin, you can very well make out the localities. This point, that the terminal point, that the pace of the payment down. Hold This is the weighing place of paper. And this is the place where the Augustinian monastery is located, Augustino, San Augustino. This is the Calvatic Canal. The present Port Kochi is the result of three alterations that happened in the past. Initially by the Portuguese, the second alteration being done by the Dutch after the occupation in 1663 and third alteration being done by the English in 1805. So, if we look at the geography, the topography of Cochin, you may not be able to identify the exact location as being found in the actual city plan of Cochin of 16th and 17th century. This is the place of the Pimenta, this is the Calvati Canal. Sorry. This is the Waipin Island. Waipin Island. This is the Indonesia Fortaleza. This is the municipal, this is the say cathedral. This is the uh, hospital. This is the Bartholomew Church, Igreja de Bartholomew. This is the first church being erected by the Germans in 1504. This is the Rua de Raita, most uh, um, uh, vibrant commercial center of the city. This is the Rua de Raita, the Zapateiros, uh, Rua de Domingos, uh, Dominican uh, uh, convent was, was located somewhere here. Yeah, this will give a tentative picture of how the city looked like. This is the seaside. This is the castle of the bishop that point of time. The, uh, later, the, the, the bishop house was here, but uh, it was a summer residence probably. This is the water channel through which the vessels used to you enter here, and the vessels were, and the commodities were loaded and unloaded, unloaded here. And this part, the other part, happened to be the Matanji region, this region. This is the City of Kochi. The three-story building is nothing other than Mother the Deus College of the Jesuits. The exact location is you may have seen Police Parade Ground, no? Near Franciscan Monastery, Franciscan Church. And they existed in that same in the very location where the parade ground is located. This is the city of Cochin from the land perspective, from the side of the land. 
the three story building which had the highest library in asia in the 60th 70th centuries this is again from the land side the city of kochi this is the same picture this is goa and the ship this is panchim this is kaburama and this is the place where the ship building activities are actually happened this is diwa this is the old goa part this is the place where shibli activities happened in 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 goa this is kannur only this much part this much part of kannur is now retained as the port the rest has gone to the navy this is called city of kannur in the 16th century this is kunyali's kota this is the place where the kunyalis also used to make their ships the ship building but we don't find any exact location in the map but this is the place where they used to make their ship this kunyali spotta kunyali this is krangannu krangannu the kuchin this koilon mana these are the things that they used to bring uh, coins this cruzado this is the copper you see how much copper is there this is obtained from south africa as a result of an archaeological Yes, sorry. Ask about the excavation that <laughs> went on there. This copper had uh, the mark of F, indicating that they belonged to Fugus. In 1502, the Portuguese wanted pepper from all the traders and the rulers, and they made an agreement with the rulers and the traders, and they demanded that we don't want. They said that we don't want any gold, we don't want any silver. What we want is copper. they agreed that at least two third of the price be given in copper india did not have proper copper deposit ketri mines were there in the ancient period in the harappan period but the mines got drained so we had to depend upon the mediterranean copper the jews used to bring copper and bronze every household in kerala has got copper vessels utensils you know urli chattagam and urli warp kuttagam in the money what else be made of bronze or of copper they all indicate that they came from outside not from india and major segment is copper came through the portuguese trade route and they came as return cargo that would mean vessels that were being used for taking copper pepper were being equally used for bringing retained cargo particular copper and that too of heavy tonnage which would end, which actually would, is suggestive of the durability the sustainability of the vessels that are being built whether in india whether abroad so i just try to say about the culture of ship building is not about mere building ships alone it's about many things associated with the ships which require a particular party a format a particular genre of ship building tradition to evolve and initially all our vessels had only simple top meaning for different decks were there but there was no gunnery there was no artillery the moment the port is entered samurain bribed milanis to milanis in 1502 and he started installing artillery in in calicut ever since uh, we find uh, artillery piece of artillery or gunnery becoming a part of indian ship building tradition as well because the presence of the portuguese necessitated a new character a new genre to appear with regard to the structure of the ship besides the uses there was also a need for a gun top a gunnery top to be erected as to resist as to withstand the colonial masters and to pursue the trade which which uh, restructured the ship building tradition unfortunately these details we get only from the portuguese and the related sources and then we had to piece them together then we are making because we, our source material highly limited and the written sources very meager and scanty 
so uh, what i have been trying to say is that resist the tradition with regard to ship building and the ship building made this society kerala society to be more maritime and the maritime consciousness is very much there among the residents of uh, kerala because almost all the commodities that they produce are actually meant for maritime markets overseas markets markets across the sea and even the sea has entered into their ethos their mentality but the vessel the device the instrument with which this interaction happen with the movement happen there uh, they remain rather incognito they, it was not that much studied so i thought i just take uh, elaborating these things uh, against the background of the, uh, the 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 historical context within which these different traditions evolved we find the uh, porakkad one type of ship building tradition evolving kochi another type of ship building tradition which we can't trace now but the beepur tradition is still active still noticeable to just got more arabic element in their ship building pattern and in their in their format as well uh, but in the uh, porakka tradition we find traces of the porakka tradition we found in the chundam mallams and the odam odams that are being built that point of time so this is in short the 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 the, the gender uh, uh, overview regarding the ship building tradition in kerala with this few words i wind up i look forward to your comments and uh, queries uh, if there are uh, i would be happy to, i would be happy to uh, respond to them you can ask in malayalam uh, sorry sit for a while Thank <laughs> you.